go. Okay, so welcome you two. Welcome everyone on Zoom. It's good to see you. We'll get started in just a second. I'm gonna start the recording for the class to the cloud. Got it. And as always, so I have some students in class, which is uh, great, even, even though the presentation is virtual. So, you know, I'm going to ask you something about last week, but last week was spring break. So did anyone visit a wetland last week? Yeah, you, yes, thank you. All right, so what, tell us about the wetland you visited. Oh, I was at Ordway uh, Fisher. Uh, Ordway Fisher Biological yeah. Preserve for work or for fun? For uh, an avian field technique course. Avian field techniques, all right. So we power out a few lakes and look at birds. Nice. What so what what birds did you see? Uh, a few wading birds, some woodpeckers, some ducks. All right. Aquatics, a couple a couple of aquatic birds. Good. Anyone else do anything exciting for spring break yet? No, the week before spring break too. Uh-huh. The seep there? Yeah, the stormwater ecological enhancement project, right? Yes, we use it. Awesome. Oh, leeches are always fun. What what class was it for? Excellent. Um, all right, excellent. So without further ado, it is our next seminar in the Water Watersheds and Wetlands Seminar, Spring 2024. Um, today we're lucky to have with us Dr. Young Gu Her. Uh, Dr. Her is an associate professor of hydrology and agricultural engineering at the Tropical Research and Education Center within IFAS. And so, and Young, your department is ag and bioengineering, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. So, um, but it, as many of you know, folks, especially folks in, in IFAS, there are these research and education centers all around the state. So Dr. Herr is down in, in Homestead, South Miami. He's been involved in a, a number of hydrological modeling and monitoring projects. And his current research is focused on evaluating the environmental impacts of agricultural systems. So obviously there's been a long history of that in South Florida in particular, and thinking about how the way we manage our croplands and production systems can be in concert or maybe less damaging to the environment. Um, he's also started looking, and I didn't know about this work, but looking at agrivoltaic systems, agrivoltaic, which I think he'll probably hopefully tell us about, but you can think about what that means. And then projecting from a really horticultural point of view, plant hardiness zones that are changing with climate change. So, hey, you used to grow tropical stuff only down where you are, but as time goes on, that tropical stuff is moving both natural systems like mangroves as well as horticultural systems. So I'm not sure exactly what you're going to tell us about, maybe a little bit of all that. But with that, um, Young, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us today. Okay, good morning. Thanks for coming and uh, your invitation to your seminar. And again, I'm Young Guer. I'm a hydrologist and agriculture engineer working at Tropical Research and Education Center in Homestead. And uh, the the, I mean, the, because you mentioned uh, the agroportic project, we just started. We are now is uh, putting the sensors and uh, putting pumps and the irrigation, the layouts. And so it, I, I didn't include any slide about that, but uh, I will have a chance to introduce the project and some interesting result in the future. So, okay, today I'm going to introduce uh, some background on uh, sea, le sea level rise and climate change issues we have in, in South Florida, and there's some result of field experiment and modeling studies. Okay, in South Florida, Southeast Florida especially, the almost 5 million people live in 10 miles or 16 kilometers from the shoreline. 3 million people live in the area lower than 5 meters from mean sea level. The average, I mean, the slope is only 0.25%. It's, it's, it's very flat. The Florida aquifer is, is shallow and highly permeable. So increase the sea level rise, uh, I mean, sea level, seawater level is likely to affect our groundwater resources and agriculture and infrastructure, fish and wildlife, and hydro hydro hydrological cycle. So let me use pen here. Okay, this, oops, oops. Okay. Why can I use this, okay. So there is a, an interface between the groundwater and the salt water under the ground. If sea level increase this much, 
a salt water will push the interface toward the, the inland aquifer like this. And then this uh, variable density flow or the, the, the interface will move to inland too. And the pumping groundwater, especially in areas too close to the, the ocean, may accelerate uh, this in salt water intrusion process. One of the ways to push back the, the salt water to the ocean side is uh, by increasing groundwater flow. Right. To do this, uh, we may need to increase groundwater recharge or infiltration from the, the ground surface into the aquifer. But bad news is uh, many climate models projected the frequency of rainfall events to decrease, but the intensity of rainfall event to increase, which means we may have a less amount of water to be infiltrated and percolated into the aquifer. Also, we may uh, take more groundwater from the aquifer to provide more drinking and irrigation water as population and the food demands may increase in the future. Uh, this kind of circumstance may accelerate the salt water into the processes. And as I mentioned, our aquifer is highly permeable. Right? So groundwater level may quickly rise as much as the uh, sea level rise so that uh, their levels may quickly reach an equilibrium point in the, in the interface. Right? This means the groundwater level may increase in the future and then stormwater stories in the soil like this will will reduce. Right? So such a hydrological change may increase the frequency of uh, root zone saturation, we call the, the groundwater flooding in Southeast Florida. Sea level rise may affect the surface water too. Now, let's say we have a four different slope from one to one or 45 per, uh, degree to the one to eight or the 12.5 slope. And one to one is like uh, somewhere northwest coast of the US. And then let's say the one to eight represent the topography of uh, Southeast Florida, just, just for comparison, right? And then let's say sea level increase by one unit or food or meter. Then in the case of one to eight slope or Florida, sea level may intrude uh, on, the, on the river, canal, and coastal areas as much as eight units or eight meter or feet, right? The amount of sea level increase will be amplified, amplified uh, the shallow, the slope and topography. So every slope of these three counties, I mean the Palm Beach, Broward and Miami counties, counties is only, as I mentioned earlier, the just 0.25%, which means 0.5 meter uh, increase of sea level can be equivalent to 200 meter inland intrusion over sea water. This is quite significant. And the sea level will be also a big concern for the urban stormwater measurement, especially in low-lying coastal areas. Let's say this is a profile of a city like Miami, right? When, uh, oops. When the tides is high, it's, uh, I'm talking about the, the top profile, the part of stormwater collected in the stormwater <laughs> drainage system cannot be discharged to the ocean quickly, right? This can be okay if the stormwater volume is small and the, the tide is not that high, but if a king tide comes after large storm event, a, a mm -hmm. relatively large amount of stormwater will be stuck into, in, the, in the drainage system like this, if you look at the second profile. And then drainage system will be blocked by the king tide. Then stormwater in the drainage system will, will be flooded or will flood the local depressional area close to the outlet. And then the problem, problem is uh, the, the amount of time for stormwater collected in the drainage system to reach the, the outlet from the east source can be much longer in, in areas that have a shallow slope like Southeast Florida. In other words, uh, stormwater moves slowly in the drainage system in low-lying areas. Such a slow stormwater movement is expected to 
frequently uh, create the stormwater discharge problem when the, the when the tide is high, right? In the future, let's say the sea level increase this much. If you look at the third one, the red color uh, represent the sea level rise projected for the, this area. Let's say and then additional low lying areas like this here, right? We flooded when stormwater is not quickly discharged from the the, the drainage system. So yeah, you're saying it could be flooding, but not even necessarily from seawater. It's flooding could be flooding from inland waters or from rainwater just because of the hydraulic change. Exactly, exactly. Right. It's like combinations. And let me show us a drone drone video I took to record the sunny day flooding event. The uh, a king tide was forecasted to happen on the October 7, uh, uh, 2017 in Miami areas. And I found that there was a rainfall event that happened a couple of days before October 7 in the Miami areas. And then I drove a truck to coastal urban areas to find the kind of, to find the evidence of sunny day flooding on the day, and then it took uh, almost two hours for me to find this site. And uh, there were some folks from the FI, I mean, the Inter I mean, Florida International University. Uh, they are they are doing uh, measuring some um, the, something and the, like uh, the salinity level of stormwater flooded in these areas. And then they told me the salinity level of flooded water here is uh, two percent. I mean, the twenty mil which is exactly in the middle of the salinity level of 3.5% of seawater and 0.5% of fresh water, right? It's kind of an evidence. So our, I mean, flooded water is, is kind of a mixture of the salt water, our seawater and our fresh water. Again, uh, there was no rain on, on, on this day, I mean, the October 7th, but the, these depressional areas close to the shoreline were flooded like this because of the backwater from the, the stormwater the drainage networks. And then, then I fly the drone to record the spatial extent of the sunny day flooding like this. Uh, this is one of the video I took on the day. Okay. And the increased the salinity levels of groundwater uh, will affect productivity and soil too. Uh, some some plants in our areas are known to be uh, sensitive to the salinity level of irrigation water. So part of the salt in the water irrigated will remain and accumulate in the soil, which may damage the soil permanently. Right? To wash out the, this salt, we need to use more fresh water, right? which will accelerate the salt water intrusion processes. Right? So, we need to come up with uh, some kind of effective measures to prevent or mitigate the, the expected uh, impacts, such as moving groundwater well away from the, the shoreline, the reducing water use uh, at home and in, at the field, and uh, we may want to recharge the, the groundwater artificially using pump. Yes. Okay, now I, I would like to quickly introduce uh, what we found from a field uh, experiment. And our team wanted to see how salinity level may affect the growth of ornamental crops in Florida. Like, uh, we, we included the uh, hibiscus and mandavilla. That, uh, these are the most common the ornamental crops grown in, in our area. And we, we could get uh, the, these ornamental crops for an experiment from the local nursery, Costa Farms. The Costa Farm is, is the biggest nursery farm in, in, in Florida. Uh, we went to the farm and checked the salinity level of irrigation water they used to grow crops. And why well, just. And then we found the irrigation level, I mean, the salinity level is just 0.5 test cement per meter, which is which means uh, irrigation water is uh, fresh, it's okay. And uh, you can see here because he discussed on the top and the mandavilla at the bottom, and we had uh, one control with the sanity level of 0.5 test cement per meter is fresh water. 
and then we increase the salinity level to 1, 1 1.5, 2, 4, 7, and 10 decimal per meter. Then we investigated how their height and width and biomass and grow, I mean the growth rate and appearance uh, re reacted to the, the different salinity level of irrigation water. And we also deployed a camera sensor to monitor their growth. And we wanted to have an inexpensive option, this kind of a remote sensing. So we came up with a, an NDVI sensor that cost only $300. We mounted it at, at, the, at the end of the wood post of 10 feet rather than the, the flying drone, because the flying drone requires a license. So we need, I need to pass the exam and this is complicated. So I just, uh, decided to use the wood stick. <laughs> and then we, we, we took our NDVI images every day. Oh my God, why is it moving? Young, just so everyone, um, and, and maybe you said it, but I missed it, but everyone know what NDVI is? Yeah, I'm sorry, what? Some people don't know NDVI. Some people know and some people don't know NDVI, but just you can give us like a simple, what does it indicate? Okay, NDVI is kind of a vegetation index. Uh, the, it is measuring the the reflectance of different uh, light, like a green and red. So it, it is measuring the, how can I say? Basically measuring the chlorophyll A. So, I mean, NDVI, the values are sensitive to chlorophyll A concentration. So the high NDVI, the value means uh, 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 plants are healthy, but low NDVI means not healthy, it has some problem or, is, or even if they are not plants. So something, right. uh, oh, I mean, the object that do not have a cloth A, don't have any, any NDVI values. Oh, make thank sense. you. So it's like the plant greenness and right, you, exactly. don't have to be a you don't have to be a gardener to know like brown plants, yellow plants, not super good, green plants, good. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Oops. It's hard to go. Okay. Uh, uh, these are some, some of the images we took, and the left is a first infrared image, and right one is processed NDVI image, and as you can see in the right image, uh, this one, this looks, oops, where is my pen? Okay. And then the, the green means relatively higher NDVI value, and the red means relatively low the NDVI value. Green means or the or healthy, I mean the, the vegetable and the red means or relatively the orange color means is not that healthy or is not the plant. Okay. So there are variations of NDVI value depending on the types of crops and then parts of the crops, right? You can see the spatial variations at the level of the plant. Oops. Okay, let me let me skip the details, but uh, here the okay, okay. Here x axis represent the different irrigation water salinity level from. Where is my pen here? Okay, let me see. Oh, oh. Okay. So we increase the salinity level from 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is a control is a completely fresh to the to ten, and then we we we. We found the above ground or biomass uh, sensitively reacted to the, the sanitary level, right? We had a four replicates per treatment and uh, this box and whisker, the plot means uh, variation of the replicate within the treatment. For example, in the case of heat because on the top, on the top is heat viscous, and biomass quickly dropped when sanitary level increased to 1.0 from 0.5. And we could see the other, the big drops when the, the level was increased to 7.0 and 10.0, right? And similar pattern was found in the case, in the case of Mandaville at the bottom. And the growth rate or increase in the height of hibiscus decreased when selenium level was increased to uh, 1.0, right? But it did not, Further decrease when the salinity level further increase up to ten, right? In the case of Mandavilla, gross rate increase even increase with the increase in the salinity level until the level the hits two point zero. Then gross rate decrease when salinity level was further increased to four or seven and ten. 
Okay, so conclusions, right? So current average, I mean, the current average, how can I say? The salinity level, like a 0.5 decimal per meter of groundwater we have in South Florida is, is safe for both ornamental crops, right? He discussed was more tolerant to high irrigation water salinity than Mandavilla. And then plant growth was significantly limited when the salinity level increased to 7.0 decimal per meter. And reported the maximum groundwater salinity concentration in, in South Florida. USGS is monitoring the salinity level along the coastline. The maximum value was almost 9.09 decimal per meter along the coastline, right? So this high salinity concentration can uh, can affect the, what is it, the ornamental crops we have here and the, can damage to the nurse crops. That's, that's one of the finds that we have here. Okay, now, and the question is how groundwater elevation or quantity and the saltwater intrusion area may change in the future, right? Because uh, we, we may have uh, the change in climate in the future, we may have the, the increased uh, sea level in the future. So we believe the only scientific way to predict or project the future, I mean, the groundwater Groundwater quantity and quality is, is, is computer simulation and the mathematical modeling. So increased groundwater level will affect the soil hydrology and crop productivity and the root system of some plants in our areas are very sensitive to soil water. And uh, for example, here the tomatoes are known to be negatively affected by soil to uh, root zone root zone saturation, where the high soil water contents. If root zone is saturated for longer than one day. And uh, these are groundwater modeling results, and we, we interpreted them into the risk of a root zone saturation using groundwater model result. And that groundwater modeling could help predict and understand what and where the, the root zone situation may occur. Okay, so, and then we expanded the groundwater modeling to entire mine data, data county, and then incorporated the future sea level rise and <clears throat> climate change projections into the groundwater model to see how much groundwater elevation may rise and how saltwater intrusion process may look like in the future. For this modeling experiment, we, we adopted a groundwater model developed by USGS, better than creating new one because it takes a lot of time and the effort. The USGS developed this model and calibrated in 2016. This model is also called the Urban Miami Dade or UMD model. I don't know why they put the urban uh, because this model also covers the agriculture areas. But anyway, so model was uh, calibrated to observations made in the canal networks and the uh, groundwater well. Oops, it's automatically just and located across the, the Miami Dade County. And then you can find some more details of, of the model in the this USGS uh, report. Okay, and the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. And uh, we call the sea level rise work group. Uh, this group updates the sea level projections for infrastructure planning and design uh, in Southeast Florida, uh, including Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade County and Monroe counties, right? And IPCC median is relatively, how can I say, liberal or, or optimistic projections here. Right, and then the 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 IPCC, I mean the NOAA intermediate high scenarios are regarded as uh, lower or upper boundaries for short term use until 2070. And then the uh, NOAA high is uh, I don't know why it's keep <laughs> I'm sorry, so it's automatically just go to next. Yeah, I don't know if you have some timing on there or whatever, but yeah, we're it's okay. We're 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 sticking with you. Okay. So uh, NOAA high is relatively conservative 
and uh, conservative sea level projections for this. So I include the, the, the in, in this uh, in the in this presentation I include only the result of a NOAA intermediate high, which is regarded as kind of a as as named represent intermediate uh, scenarios. Okay, there are several future climate scenarios. Among them, the SSP2 uh, 4.5 represent a central pathway in which trends continue uh, our historical uh, patterns without sub substantial deviation. So it is. Uh, it has been used as a, like a, like a, what is it representative uh, climate scenarios in many other studies. I also included the only result of SSP uh, 4.0, a uh, 4.5 scenario in this presentations. And then there are many different types of climate models and projections available. And I try to include the the, the climate models as as many as possible. Uh, so that I can quantify the uncertainty associated with the uh, climate modeling. So for this uh, modeling experiment, I compiled uh, the air temperature and the precipitation projections made using 29 climate models, and I've added them to UMD model, I mentioned earlier, the groundwater model. And then, I mean, <clears throat> global scale climate projections were, were downloaded to, uh, not downloaded, to, downscaled to 25 individual local weather stations. Uh, and then the, the, the county was uh, represented with the uh, grid cells and each cell is uh, 500 meter, 500 meter large. And then groundwater modeling results were summarized by the land cover, land use types and the uh, distance drawn from the shoreline like this. Okay, this is overall projections of, of future precipitation for Miami-Dade County. As you can see in this plot, the annual precipitation does not change substantially. Okay. Uh, there is no uh, significant trend, but uh, may increase a little bit at the rate of 0.3 millimeter, millimeter per 10 years, which means it's almost nothing, right? So, but uh, they, they are frustrating over time, over years. And, and considering the amount of uncertainty in the projection, climate projections, I would say the, the increased rate may be not, not that meaningful, but I can say overall projection may not increase or decrease in the future. Okay. okay, climate models agree on air temperature with each other, which is good. So if you look at the y-axis, the, the uncertainty band is relatively small, like a, about a two, two, two degrees Celsius. The upper one is uh, daily maximum, lower one is daily, I mean, daily minimum. So daily maximum minimum air temperature were projected to increase by 1.5 to 1.8 degrees Celsius by 2020. And then the, for the far future, like 2100, the worst case scenario, like a, the RCP 8.5 projected uh, the air temperature to increase by five degrees Celsius. This, this is a worst case scenario. I just plotted mm -hmm. and compared the three sea level rise scenarios I included in the modeling experiment, the IPCC median, NOAA intermediate high and the NOAA high. So uh, I, I'm, I'm now I'm focusing on the green one, NOAA intermediate high. Overall, the groundwater elevation was projected to increase by 0.25 meter in the near future. Near future means 2050. And then 0.95 meter in the far future means by the 2100. Groundwater uh, elevation projections uh, vary with the sea level and climate scenarios and locations and the seasons, right? And the NOAA high, the worst case scenario and SSP5 or the RCP 8.5 scenario, it, it, this is also worse the, the climate scenarios. This combination projected the groundwater elevation to increase by 0.31 meter in the near future, but in the far future, the 1.31 meter. And then groundwater elevation projections may, uh, may, may vary by the, the, the uh, land covers. So I'm gonna skip the, these details. 
And then the projected increase in the groundwater elevation is greater closer to the shoreline, right? That makes sense, it's obvious, right? In the near future, for, for example, groundwater elevation of the areas close to 35, I mean, they're not close, they say the areas located 35 to 40 meter, 40 kilometer from the shoreline were projected to decline point zero one meter, it's nothing. So which means uh, that, uh, I mean, that those areas far from the shoreline may not be affected by the sea level rise. But areas like a uh, ten, uh, not ten, is zero to five kilometer from the shoreline were projected to increase by one point three three meters under the most likely, oh my god, most likely the the stable rise scenarios. Young, yeah, can you just con contrast for us? So, like for a one and a half meter increase in groundwater level. Mm -hmm. Um, is that like, does that like basically match exactly the one and a half meter increase in sea level? Is it bit much bigger? Is it much smaller over the same time period? F just as like a way to, to gauge our, like to put it into context. Right. That's, that's good question. Okay. Let me go back and check it. I had a table in a slide, but uh, I didn't include that. There, that, that one with the red and black and everything is the squiggle lines, the other, the one more down. Okay, here. I guess that's good, right? Huh? Yeah. It's, it's a, a sea level. Yeah. Right, it's a quite similar to the, 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 how can I say, level of the sea level rise. I mean, the, 1.5, yeah, it's quite similar, to, but it's a little bit less than the, the projected sea level rise. I mean, the, let me check. I don't know why it's hard to control. It's more or less. This is elevation is a, bit, a little bit more than, for example, the 2100, the worst case scenario is 1.62, something like that. And then we have, is yes, Right, you are right. It's quite similar to the, I mean, projected uh, groundwater elevation is quite similar to the projected uh, sea level rise. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, but here. So uh, then the, the impacts of a projected climate and sea level, sea level changes on groundwater quality. Here, groundwater quality means it's a the salinity level, okay, salinity concentration of uh, of uh, the fresh water, fresh uh, groundwater, were quantified for the areas those aquifers are intruded by blackish and uh, seawater. Okay, blackish water has a more salinity level or more salinity than the fresh water, but not as much as uh, I mean the seawater between the 0.5 and the three percent. The Senate of breakage water is usually right, 0 0.5 to 30 gram per liter, grams per liter. So the area affected by seawater was expected to increase substantially from 2020 to 2100. The area affected by seawater or salt water were projected to increase from 26% here, right? And then in the baseline scenario, right? To the almost 34% in the far future. And then we have two different areas, right? And the salt water, I mean, seawater and blackish water. Now, now I'm talking about the blackish water. The area affected by blackish water was projected to decrease, not increase, decrease in the future. The average size of a blackish water area might decrease from 13% in the baseline and to the 10% in the far future. Let me explain why this happened. And the, the areas affected by salt water, including both seawater and blackish water, projected to overall increase in the future. But the area to be affected by only affected only by blackish water may decrease, while the areas affected only by the, the seawater may increase. There is always blackish water between the fresh water and salt water, right? And the both seawater and breakage water may intrude into the aquifer of the inland areas, but the seawater may move faster toward the inland than breakage water, right? Does it make sense? So 
So UMD modeling project is the, the, the interface between the fresh groundwater and seawater to be narrowed. It is gonna be shrinked in, in the future. For example, this yellow area will be will be get smaller in the future, right? And then which means gradient of uh, salinity level from the fresh water to salt water or fresh uh, salt seawater to fresh water is gradient is getting uh, is will be I mean the steeper in the future as sea level rise. Does it make sense? Any questions? It's, like, it's compressed between the, it's more compressed. Right, exactly. More compressed, right? Because salt water move faster than the flakish water into the into the aquifer. So overall, the salt water, including the flakish and seawater, intrude into the aquifer, but the seawater move faster than the 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 brackish water. Okay, I want to skip this uh, because it's about the land cover and uh, use. So. Okay, so I could uh, calculate the, the elevation differences between the, our baseline current scenario and the future scenario like this. And here the black represent the agricultural areas. And uh, as you can see, the agricultural areas, uh, groundwater elevation may increase in the future. Also, also, I mean, the degree of increase is may depending on, uh, it dependent on the location, especially distance from the shoreline. And then uh, I also calculated the probability of being included. And again, if you look at the agricultural areas uh, with, with the dark, I mean the black uh, colors, and the fortunately, uh, the current uh, spatial extent of agricultural area may not be uh, affected by salt water intrusion processes I mean, in, in the future. If, if you, I mean, the, as you can see in the lab, map, the, on the southeast part of the part of the, the county may be uh, intruded by the salt water, including seawater and brackish water. Right. So other areas are uh, relatively safe. This is, is not what I expected, and what this is not what uh, my, many people believe. But the uh, uh, modeling <laughs> showed this. But uh, and then uh, it makes sense because uh, we have a uh, lots of the it, because this this southwest southeast area is uh, so flat it has a uh, now it is, uh, there are the salt I mean the salt water marsh is distributed along the these lines uh, which means we have also the 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 mangrove areas is that means we already have the salt water in in these areas but other areas uh, has a. Uh, we have a very dense canal networks here. So here the light blue represent the canal networks here. Something like that, right? We have a lots of network. And then we found that, for example, if you look at the, these areas, we have a relatively sharp uh, uh, interface or gradient between the, uh, the fresh water and salt water here, but uh, because uh, the, the canal networks or canal uh, helps uh, the recharging the recharging groundwater or the they I mean the canal networks are holding lots of water and then the water is 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 going to be rich I mean the percolated into aquifer especially in dry seasons and then it helps to maintain the groundwater level high. Right, and then it's it also helping. That's why it is helping the salt water intrusion. I mean, the it helped to block or slow the salt water intrusion process, especially the the these areas. Okay, and uh, groundwater projections, as as you as you see in the in the slide, uh, are sensitive to groundwater level and the climate change scenarios. Right, and then this. This, this presentation focuses on the NOAA intermediate high scenarios, but if you consider the worst case scenarios and the projected overall groundwater elevation will increase by up to two meters by the end of this century. So as you can see here, there is a big, big differences in the syllabus projections developed by the different agencies and scenarios. And we also have a different, I mean, the future climate projections. 
by climate models and uh, uh, different scenarios. Okay, so findings and the groundwater level was uh, was much more sensitive to sea level rise than saltwater intrusion processes. That makes sense. And then groundwater level and saltwater intrusion areas uh, were much more responsive to groundwater level, uh, groundwater, not sea level rise than climate change. It also makes sense, right? And groundwater level in the coastal areas were more sensitive to sea level rise than those of inland areas. And then impacts of uncertainty in sea level rise scenarios on groundwater modeling results were much greater than that of climate change scenarios. These are what we found. And then uh, I want to skip the, these details for. And then the groundwater of agriculture areas was projected to increase by 0.24 meter by 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2050 and 0.75 meter by the 2100 compared to the baseline groundwater scenarios and elevation. And groundwater elevation over agricultural areas was expected to increase faster than other land use and covers, such as wetland and upland areas. So it can be higher than those of the other areas in the, in the far future. Okay. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the main conclusion, actually. The modern research uh, indicate that the agricultural land use in, in Southeast Florida may experience root zone saturation where the groundwater flooding more frequently in the future because of the high groundwater level table. Oops. And then, so we may need to have a, what is it? A, adaptive agricultural management practice that can mitigate the impact. The many farmers and the, the general public here, the concern about the salt water intrusion only, but the, the main issue may be the high groundwater level. And then we may lose the, the, the buffer, I mean, the or, I mean, stormwater storage in the, in, the, on the, in the soil profile. And we may have a, uh, the surface water flooding more well, frequently, and then the groundwater flooding or high, the salt water, high soil water uh, problem in the future. Okay, this is the last part of my talk. Um, so you only have about five minutes, but we also want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I don't know if you want to, um, if you want to fast forward to sort of the overall summary, or if you want to try to just make some major points here about the Lego stuff. Okay, let me let me move us very quickly. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. This is the last part, and we. I mean, this is uh, the the dissertation study of my previous. I mean, the former uh, PhD student. We had uh, two questions, and the first question is how closely the how close are the water quality issues of lake associated with the water and nutrient loading from its upstream areas or the the Kissing River? I mean, the basin. And the how will global scale climate change influence the water watershed and lake system in the future? And then the, we prepared the two different models for the study areas. The EFDC model is, is, uh, is a three dimensional uh, hydrodynamic model that can describe the water body, the, the hydrodynamics developed by EPA for the Lake of Chobe. And then we also uh, prepare the SWAM model for the, the Kissim River Basin, it's a drainage, upstream drainage uh, watershed of Lake of Chobe. So we combined these two models to see how the future climate projections or uh, pro, uh, climate change may affect the water quality and the quantity of Lake of Chobe. Okay, I, I wanna skip all of these. And uh, this is uh, what one, one of the findings we have is very interesting. Okay, so we found uh, wind speed is, is quite critical to algal bloom issues. So here is an explanation, okay. Increased wind speed will increase the strength of shear stress on the bottom of the lake, right? So which can, uh, okay, because increased wind speed will increase the speed of the water current and then increase the shear stress exercising on the, on the, on the bottom of the lake, which can detest the set of the particle and then put them into the, the, uh, the water column, right? And then this is called the sediment resuspension. And then it will increase turbidity 
and then decrease the intensity of the light in the water column. And then, the, and then it's going to decrease the so solar radiation strengths. Okay, sorry. And then the decrease solar radiation will decrease algal photosynthesis rate and bio biomass, right? Does it make sense? So like, there are two critical factors controlling LG growth, right? Nutrient or food and then radiation or energy, right? Lake Okeechobee receives lots of nutrients from its uh, upstream watershed, the Kissimmee River Basin, right? So nutrients are not a limiting factor. Then solar radiation can limit the LG growth. And then wind speed can affect the amount of radiation LG can receive by controlling turbidity of the water column. That is uh, one, one of the finding. And then uh, let me skip all uh, details. And uh, okay, air temperature was uh, was projected to increase in the future. And then the precipitation depths uh, was projected not to increase or decrease, just fluctuate fluctuate over time. And then let me skip the details and uh, let's go to the conclusion. Okay, and. Uh, the model parameters directly related to the, the LG processes like uh, LG growth had a greater impact on algal bio biomass rather than other parameters controlling nutrient cycle. And then, as I mentioned earlier, impact of wind speed on algal biomass was greater than that of external loading, external nutrient loading from the, the upstream watershed. And then flow and uh, sediment load from upstream, uh, the drainage area may, may decrease in the future a little bit. And the, but the TP load was projected to increase in the future, uh, especially when the, we, our current management practice like manure and fertilizer rate are maintained in the future, okay? And then the water quality of lake was projected to degrade in the future because of the, the projected increase in air temperature and or the, the increase uh, amount of total phosphorus loaded to the to the to the lake. Okay, and then the, I, I I didn't uh, I skipped that part, but uh, we also tried the, the the three different water level operation. I mean the high level, maintaining high level, mid level, low level, but uh, uh, maintaining the high level elevate, uh, level of the lake of Chobe can reduce the the nitrogen phosphorus uh, concentration. But it didn't help to reduce the, the severity or intensity of the algal bloom issues. Right? Oops. Okay, let me skip. And then the, the findings suggest the water level operation practice may or uh, would re reduce the nutrient level, but uh, may not help uh, what it mitigate the uh, algal bloom. And, uh, and then this modern research demonstrates the water quality of lake was a function of air temperature and, uh, and internal hydrodynamics driven by the, the, the wind, right? And the uh, lake, lake uh, I mean, the water level operation practices, not just the uh, external loading from the, the, the drainage watershed. And uh, this is all I have. I'm sorry to take too much time. No, no problem. So you, wanted, you told three stories, so thanks. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Her. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll start with questions in the room. We have just a few minutes for questions, but if anyone on YouTube or on Zoom, um, if you're on Zoom and you want to unmute, you're welcome to. If you're on YouTube, pop it into the chat and we will convey the question to Dr. Herb. Okay, so you saw about salinity for horticultural plants, we saw about groundwater modeling, and we saw then about very quickly Lego. So questions from the crowd. I guess I have a question yeah. about um, the implication of groundwater level rise on like our groundwater infrastructure, will that affect our ability to pump groundwater out and that kind of thing as we are dealing with it rise? So we have to put new infrastructure in place. So the question about the rising water table, yeah, how do we how do we manage that? Do we have enough infrastructure? Do we need to build new pumps or what are we going to do? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, the, to be honest, I don't know. But uh, here in South Florida, the the homeowners were recommended to raise their, the, I mean, the, the elevation of the home. So we have a, the new, I mean, the home, I mean, the, the building, I mean, the regulation. And uh, we have a nuclear plant, I mean, the power generation plant here, and uh, they are using the, 
they 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 used to use the surface water cool down their reactor, and the, they changed the the uh, the practices, and then they they were I mean the taking groundwater to cool down the reactor, and then and we found that that practice uh, may may how can I say accelerate the salt water intrusion processes, and uh, they stopped doing that, and uh, they they are trying to come up with <laughs> the other better better plan to take water. I mean the to to cool down the reactor. And then, of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, the urban and uh, stormwater drainage uh, is, is, is directly affected by the sea level because the outlet will be easily or frequently blocked by the high sea level in the future more frequently. And then the, there are many depressional areas along the coastline, especially in urban areas. We have some uh, environmental justice issues here because uh, many poor, I mean, the community are located along the, uh, the coastline and depression areas. And then the pumping, uh, the, the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, they are using the UMD model, exactly the same model I'm using to, to, to test uh, their the different scenarios. They are using that model to, to figure out the, the new location of pumping and uh, the, what is it, the test the, the new, I mean, the pumping rate is safe or not in, in terms of the salt water intrusion and flooding. So they are using the, the, those model and that model to, for, I mean, the, in their, the decision making processes. That is uh, the nice thing to hear. And, um, and uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, we have a consortium that like uh, Palm Beach, uh, Broward, and the Miami-Dade and Monroe County, we have a consortium, they are meeting every year. We have an annual meeting and uh, they are uh, they're listening the, the comments of the from the expert and they, they, we, we, we meet and discuss, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of a long-term process is, uh, at, uh, be honest, uh, at this moment, uh, we don't know how, how, how can it slow down the salt water intrusion and how we can prevent, uh, what is it? Uh, the how they projected the uh, the increase in the the flooding the events frequency in the future. Uh, it's yeah. a big challenge. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Since heard Dr. <laughs> yeah, heard it for Doctor Her before. Yeah. You gotta go, Destin. Yes. yes, I would like to know if uh, you relate the groundwater level modeling to the two costs that you study. I mean. Uh, it went from like different climate scenarios and projections to find that uh, it may affect the, the biomass productivity. What, what about the two crops that we study? Are you trying to apply the same modeling, the two crops, to see what is going to happen in the future? David, can, can you repeat the questions? You know, the first thing you showed us was about the two crops, the hibiscus, and I think the winter millet, and then you showed groundwater modeling. So have you tried to apply the results from the second study towards the first issue about, about uh, salinizing or raising water tables? And if you have to go to the last side, there's... That is a great question. Actually, the, the, I, I, have, I should have done the modeling study first and then figure out the, how... <laughs> The yeah. in the future, and then they apply the the, the, the findings to the, the field experiment. But at that, at that moment, uh, we we okay, the, we we figured out the the modeling may take a lot of time. So we spent the two years to learn how to use this model, and uh, another one year to get all the data and uh, summarize it. And then at that moment, we had a small funding to test the. The, the 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 potential impact of salinity onto the the ornamental crops. That's why we we did uh, the, the experiment first, and then that's why we we made uh, several assumptions. Like uh, we have uh, several different uh, the salinity scenario from the 0.5 to 10. So because we didn't have the the ideas uh, how salinity may increase in the future. Of course, but uh, from the the modeling result, we found the salinity may not be that big issues in, in the future in, in terms of the agriculture, the, what is it, the productions. So, but we still have some agricultural areas that distributed along the coastal line. So one of the recommendations that I made from the, this modeling study was uh, 
we may not want to expand our agriculture areas, uh, especially the, the coastal areas. I mean, the in, in the close to the coast. I mean, shoreline. But we may want to maintain some some inland uh, the agriculture areas that are not. They may not be affected by salt rain tourism process. But problem is, is there, this is a trade off between the the groundwater level elevation increase and the salt water because. If you want to uh, slow down or block the, the salt water intrusion, we may need to increase the groundwater level, right? Because we need to increase the groundwater recharge. But it does, if we increase the groundwater in recharge, we may have a higher groundwater elevation, and then it's gonna bring the more the I mean the I mean the the flooding issues more frequently in the future. So we need to choose one of these. We cannot solve yeah. the both at the same time. So. I don't know that this is how this is a maker <laughs> may come up with a solution to handle these two, but uh, from the, the modeling, I mean, the output, uh, I, I see that we we may need to choose one and then the agriculture area may may need to come up with the, the better, I mean, practice or plan to to mitigate the, the high, the groundwater elevation in the future. I mean, salt water interior is less Less uh, sensitive or less critical. I mean, the, compared to the the high groundwater or the groundwater flooding issues. Thank you, thank you, Young. Thank you so much for joining us at our seminar today. Um, 